All of America is looking for solutions in the war on terrorism. Straight ahead on Eyewitness News Live at 6, George Knapp shows us what's being done in Las Vegas to help in that fight. Chemical warfare is getting attention. We'll find out what local companies are doing to keep dangerous chemicals out of the hands of terrorists. And thousands of military reservists are being called to homeland duty, but that could put the city's police force at risk. We'll show you why. You're watching Eyewitness News at 6 with Gary Waddell, Paula Francis, Kevin Jennison, and Dave McCann. And we know that we represent and, and are taking back with us uh, Las Vegas, and I know the team members from top to bottom are extremely grateful for that support. An urban search and rescue team from here in the Valley is headed to New York City to help in the rescue mission at the World Trade Center. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. We'll have that story, a look at anti-terrorism conference set for Southern Nevada, and more on what the war on terrorism could mean to Southern Nevada's police forces coming up. But first, we want to update you on today's developments. President Bush appealed for religious tolerance when he met today with American Sikh and Muslim leaders. The president also visited CIA headquarters, praising the agents for working hard to keep America free. Attorney General John Ashcroft says there is a clear and present danger of additional terrorist attacks that could include trucks carrying hazardous chemicals. How prepared is Southern Nevada for a terrorist attack? Next month, experts at a counterterrorism summit will try to answer that in detail. The summit, which will be held in Henderson, is being organized by U.S. Senator Harry Reid. George Knapp is here with the story. George. Gary and Paula, for at least one day, October 8th, Southern Nevada will be a focal point of counterterrorism planning. The way we hear it, Senator Reid had originally planned to hold a full congressional hearing here on that same date, a hearing to focus on energy issues. But the events of September 11th changed all that. Few details have been released about the summit. Here's what we know. Two people that we've spoken Nevada with. Senator Harry Reid is juggling more than a few balls in the air. First, he appeared on Capitol Hill with leaders of different religious faiths in a call for tolerance and understanding in these tense times. He also obtained Senate passage of a military appropriations bill, which awards more money to Nellis Air Force Base, the Nevada National Guard, and millions of dollars to help clean up the water supply in Fallon, a Nevada town now known for its cluster of childhood leukemia cases. Finally, Reid announced a few sparse details about his plans for a counter-terrorism summit to be held in Henderson in early October. And the purpose of that is to have people understand of the support and really the confidence they should have in the people that are making Southern Nevada a safe place. We're going to hear from the sheriff, we're going to hear from people from the Department of Energy. We're going to have a wide range of people whose lives spent making sure that Nevada is safe. They're doing everything they can to make it safe. And I thought this would be a way for people to feel better about themselves and about our community. But the summit is expected to be much more than a group hug. The local economy is reeling because of post-attack jitters. But Southern Nevada has good reason to be nervous. The suspected terrorists, after all, are known to have congregated here in the weeks leading up to the attacks back east. And our area certainly has targets worthy of the wrath of Osama bin Laden and company. Not only the high-profile glitter domes of decadence on the Strip, but also targets of military significance. Nellis, the test site, Hoover Dam. Senator Reid's summit will bring together experts from numerous agencies to explain how prepared we are for the unthinkable, a terrorist attack here. Included in the mix will be representatives from local hospitals to explain how they might handle large numbers of casualties. The full schedule of who might testify has not been finalized, but the general idea is to make locals sleep a little better at night. The public is not only invited to attend the summit, public attendance seems to be the main reason to hold this event in the first place. Again, the date is October 8th in Henderson. We will have further details on this event as they become available. You mentioned that Fallon could get money for uh, cleaning up its water supply. Why is that coming out of a military bill? Well, it's $6.2 million, and it's going to help get the arsenic out of Fallon's water. It's going to be paid, though, to the Fallon Naval Air Station. The Navy is going to take point on a water treatment facility that will not only benefit the base, but will benefit benefit everyone who lives in the town. Okay. It's, the, uh, it's not known if the arsenic in the water, of course, causes yeah. the child's leukemia, but as the levels that they have yeah. can't possibly be good. Okay. Thanks, but, George. Sure. Nine people in three states have been arrested for trying to commit fraud by obtaining licenses to transport hazardous materials. 
That comes after FBI warnings that terrorists could attack the U.S. with chemical or biological weapons. Truck companies in the Valley that transport hazardous materials say they're on the lookout for anyone who looks or acts suspicious. Eyewitness News is live. Tom Jones joins us with the story. Tom. Well, Gary, first of all, one truck company owner who operates a facility that transports hazardous waste all around the country told us if a truck loaded with hazardous materials got into the wrong hands, it would be much worse than what we saw in New York. That's why that owner is very cautious about any and everyone he hires or talks to. That's only a 24,000 pound load. David Miller's trucking company transports hazardous materials like acids and chemical compounds across the country. He says it's a job that's dangerous and Squad even more so if terrorists get a hold the of the loaded trucks. In the wrong hands, it's a time bomb just waiting to happen. That's why Miller is very concerned about reports that several suspects have been arrested for fraudulently obtaining or trying to obtain hazardous material transportation licenses. Even before the arrest, Miller says he's always been careful about who he does business with. Now he'll be on the lookout for terrorists. David Miller is so serious about keeping terrorists out of his trucks that when we called him for an interview, he told us he wouldn't give us any information until we came to his business and proved who we were. But we are awful, awful careful about who calls us, who we're doing business with, and that's why I had this direct conversation with you. Miller says all his drivers go through extensive background checks and they have to have licenses and know all the rules and regulations. Despite all that, he says a terrorist can slip through the cracks. The only thing we can do is keep a more tighter handle or grip on things. We cannot be too careful. Now, the men who are accused of trying to obtain those hazardous materials transportation licenses were arrested in Missouri, Michigan, and Washington State. There's no word yet if they had any Las Vegas connections. Tom Jones, Eyewitness News, live. Thank you, Tom. Lawmakers in Washington are working out ways to make the country safer in the war on terrorism. A top concern on Capitol Hill is biological terrorism. After word that some of the individuals linked to the September 11th hijackers had tried to get licenses to transport hazardous waste. President Bush is calling on Congress to tighten security at airports, put armed marshals on all commercial flights, and make wiretapping laws more flexible. The president visited the CIA today, encouraging agents and reminding them of the work that is ahead. We must never forget that this is a long struggle, uh, to, that, that there are evil people in the world who hate America, and we won't relent. In Afghanistan today, protesters stormed the long, empty U.S. Embassy in Kabul. Rioters tore down the U.S. seal and destroyed everything left in the building. Hundreds of reservists around our valley have been put on alert for possible deployment in America's war on terrorism. Many of those reservists are police officers. Eyewitness News reporter Lisa Johnson examines how local police departments are preparing to handle the expected loss of manpower. Tim Gross has just been told he must report next Monday for active duty. He's a member of the 99th Police Squadron of the Air Force Reserves. He's also a Metro Police Officer and now must leave his job. It's, it's more of a patriotic thing for me uh, as I've been in the military reserves uh, and active duty for over 18 years now. I, you know, I mean, it's, if I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there, obviously. Officer Gross is just one of hundreds of police officers around the valley who are also reservist. As these part-time soldiers prepare for active duty, police departments are preparing for the loss of their full-time officers. Metro faces losing 300 police officers to the military. And if people did have to leave for military service that were in critical jobs that were there to ensure the public safety, those jobs would be filled. No new hires will be made, personnel will be shifted, so all soldiers are assured jobs when they return. But that depletes police manpower. And the police officers who are called up for active duty face another type of depletion, a salary depletion. Most police officers make 50000 or more. Their military pay would be less than half that. And they also would face losing their insurance for their dependents. The police association is planning to start a catastrophic bank. Employees will be able to 
time into this bank, and as employees exhaust their accrued leave, they'll be able to dip into this bank of time so they can supplement their income. And that at least makes the financial hardship Officer Tim Gross now faces as a soldier a little easier to bear. Lisa Johnson, Eyewitness News. North Las Vegas and Henderson's police unions are also considering catastrophic banks for their reservists. Henderson's police department is also extremely concerned because it is already understaffed and now faces an additional 15 percent shortage if these reservists are all called up. 62 Clark County firefighters, Metro police officers, doctors, engineers, and even canine units have left for Ground Zero to help in the search and recovery efforts. They are Nevada Task Force One, one of the 28 federal emergency management rescue teams in the country. Eyewitness News is live. Cindy Caesar is at the Clark County Fire Training Center with the story. Cindy. That's right. Well, this place normally is a fire training center, but today it was a staging area for these 62 rescue workers to head to New York. They are bringing with them manpower and money. They have 50,000 pounds of specialized search equipment and three canine dogs to sniff through the rubble. But this FEMA urban search and rescue team of Clark County firefighters, metro officers, doctors, and engineers also have a check for $364,000. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. The money is from donations raised in the Las Vegas community We're that trying. will go to Thank the families of the fallen rescue workers in New York and at the That's Pentagon. Sorry. We know we're taking back the hearts and prayers and thoughts of Las Vegas. We've seen that in uh, people who want to give money or say prayers or give blood or write letters or cards. And we've had people stop by the fire stations to do what they could or, or give what they could. We've had children give their, their allowances or, or piggy banks or whatever. And we know that we represent and, and are taking back with us uh, Las Vegas. And I know the team members from top to bottom are extremely grateful for that support. Now, the rescue workers plan on being back in New York for 10 days. They will be taking pictures of their experiences there. And if you would like to see those pictures, you can log on to our website at klastv.com. There will be a link for those pictures on that website. Now, it is very possible that this rescue team could be called back to New York again in the next couple of months since it could take several months to clean up Ground Zero. Cindy Caesar, Eyewitness News, live. All right, Cindy, thank you. We've all felt the effects of the economic downturn in the state. The downturn in the economy is hurting the state's tax base. Tomorrow, Governor Kenny Gwynn will talk about our state's economy in a special broadcast. The State of the Economy speech is set for 6.05 at 5 tomorrow evening. The governor will speak from the executive offices in Carson City, and you can see that speech live right here on Channel 8. A 67-year-old Las Vegas woman was beaten to death in her home. Straight ahead on Eyewitness News Live at 6, we'll show you how police tracked down the suspect in her murder, and you'll hear from the victim's family. Plus, finding the right person and procedure saved one woman's life. Ahead in medical breakthroughs, find out what made the difference between life and death. Later in this hour, we've all felt the uncertainty of the past few weeks, but that feeling could actually be bringing people closer together. We'll show you why. First, Kevin is here with a look at your weather. Kevin. Paul, the unusual warmth is continuing, and we don't see it relenting anytime real soon, although there are some changes possible for next week, which is October. We'll give you all of those details. Take a look at all of your neighborhood weather. Complete seven-day forecast coming right up. Eyewitness News will be right back. You're watching Eyewitness News with Paula Francis and Gary Waddell. This portion of Eyewitness News is brought to you by Dodge. Things are getting a little bit easier for the family of a murdered Las Vegas woman. The suspect in the case was arrested today in Mexico. Colleen May has been following the story and she joins us with the latest. Colleen. Well, Paul and Gary, it's a story that Eyewitness News has been following. We first told you earlier this week about a Las Vegas woman murdered. And police say tonight the manhunt is over. The suspect behind bars. 67-year-old Shirley Rogers took in a homeless man who police believe then killed her. Rogers' body was found in her home in the northwest part of the valley on Saturday. Police say the suspect, 24-year-old Brett Jones, fled in her vehicle. It was found in Yuma, Arizona. He was captured this afternoon in Mexico. Police say Jones was hitching a ride with a truck driver in Mexico when they came to a checkpoint. There he was arrested and found with the victim's handgun. 
Her children are still coping with the loss that their mother is gone. She had her faults, and one of her faults was trusting people. And that's a terrible fault this day and age to have. Frustrated that somebody that she would take in to care for would uh, treat her this way and take advantage of her. It didn't even happen this way. I want my mom to be honored. I want everything he deserves, he gets, or whoever did this. A memorial service for Shirley Rogers will be held tomorrow. That's Thursday at 1 p.m. at the Christ the Servant Lutheran Church. That's on 2 South Pecos Road in Henderson. Now, Shirley Rogers had lived in Las Vegas Valley for 14 years, worked at Nellis Air Force Base as an operator. She was actually known as Operator Number 7. So the family wants to get out and make sure that all her friends here in the Valley know that uh, she has passed and a memorial mm -hmm. service to honor her will be held tomorrow. The family is obviously devastated. Do, would they still want her to help others? Well, they say that's one of the things that they loved about their mom mm -hmm. the most is that she gives so much to others. But they said that, told me today that they want others to learn from this tragedy. They say if you want to help someone, go through an agency and let mm -hmm. your family and neighbors know what you're doing in case you do need help. She didn't tell most of her family that she had taken this young man in. Yeah. So it was a shock to them when they found out this happened. So make sure you let family, neighbors, and try to go through an agency uh, so they can check people out. Good advice, especially yeah. these days. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks. Cheyenne High School student is in serious condition at University Medical Center. He was stabbed in the stomach. Police say the boy was stabbed while talking to friends at school on Monday afternoon. Suspect believed to be 20 to 22 years old, and police say that he might have known the boy. Soccer players at Clark High School and in the nearby neighborhood finally have a field to play on. The city put about $300,000 into the project. Clark High School players are excited for the field on campus so they can host home games. Before this field was built, they had to travel to Cashman Middle School to practice. Councilman Mike McDonald participated in the ribbon cutting ceremony today. He says the field has other benefits in addition to convenience. It helps them get off the streets. It helps them play with something right in their neighborhood. Uh, we have a very large Hispanic population that I've been working with that came up with this idea. How about youth soccer? We're going to sponsor a team out of the neighborhood and hold other neighborhood events. A youth soccer league will be able to use the field year-round. That's nice. Yeah. Very nice to have that field. Kevin's here. Tell us all about the weather. Get a little sweat going playing soccer this time of year. Definitely. Really? Temperatures staying warm. The days are getting shorter. Sun is rising later, setting earlier, but it's still awfully warm out there. Look at the long shadows in the Las Vegas Valley where there even are shadows. Sunset is officially at 632 this evening. However, that's the time it goes below the horizon. It goes below the mountains earlier, so it starts getting darker earlier than when actually the sun would set. Let's begin with real-time neighborhood weather, and we will start at Gordon McCall. Country, one of our 35 neighborhood weather stations where it's 92 degrees. The breeze is light now at 3 miles per hour. Humidity is certainly a tolerable 13%. Near Jones and Smoke Ranch, it's 93 right now, also a 2 mile per hour wind. Up in Summerlin, 91 degrees, a little more wind, but not too much going on there. And in Pahrump, 90 degrees and 18%. Other neighborhood temperatures, still 100 up near Cary and Hollywood, 97 near Cheyenne and Las Vegas Boulevard. It's 96 up near Buffalo and Cheyenne and down in Green Valley, 95 degrees. Outside the valley, already down to 65 on the mountain. It is an even 90 out of the Red Rock Visitors Center and still 100 degrees in Laughlin. Humidity levels, they're pretty low. I mean, this is a very dry air mass, generally between about 10 and 15 percent, a little higher up on the mountain. In town, same numbers with the highest being up near Buffalo and Cheyenne at 16 percent. And speaking of highs, a couple of neighborhoods did not get out of the 90s today. The rest of the valley in the lower 100s with the high being 106 down near Windmill in Paradise. Outside the valley, anywhere from 75 on the mountain, 105 in Mesquite, Laughlin and Death Valley hit 100 and a dozen today. At McCarran, the top temperature and even 109 above normal. It was also 9 above normal on the low side. Look at the records, 1947 and 1948. Complete reversal there of the following year. Inside the car... Carmometer still up around 130 degrees with the sun beating down, even with the sunshade on. Okay, what we're following now is Hurricane Juliet, large hurricane, 120 mile per hour sustained winds, and it's drifting to the north northwest at 10 miles per hour, but the forward progress is expected to slow over the next couple of days. Eventually, we think some of the clouds will make it here to southern Nevada. But in the meantime, once its progress slows, it's going to move into cooler waters there. And hurricanes really need water that's about 80 degrees or warmer. And we know the water temperature off the California coast is already down in the upper 60s. So it would just completely fall apart if it continued to move north.
but it's not going to do that. It's going to keep spinning and throwing some of the clouds into the southwest. We might eventually get a few more clouds and some breezes, but in the meantime, the jet stream is sort of guiding everything in this direction. So this mess in the Pacific will not really have an impact on us. We'll wait and see if Juliet can throw any curveballs our way, but though at its slow rate, it wouldn't be until early next week at the earliest, maybe even later than that. Tonight clear, 70 degrees for the low temperature, just a light breeze tonight. That'll fire up tomorrow, 10 to 20, with a few stronger gusts in the afternoon. Plenty of sunshine, though, high of 100. Again, some neighborhoods up around 105. Wow. And a look ahead at your seven-day extended forecast, mid-90s over the weekend. And there are those potential clouds early next week from Juliet. Potential is the key word there. Low 90s for the high, overnight lows in the mid-60s, but that's how we expect to start. October, which would actually be a couple of degrees cooler than where we started October last year, if you're keeping score at home. Was it 100 degrees last year? On the 1st of October. By the 11th, it was 68. <laughs> There'll be a quiz later on. Okay, we'll keep track. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Kevin. Medical advances are only beneficial if they are available to the patients who need them. One woman with a brain aneurysm is thankful her doctor found her a specialist who could save her life with a new procedure. That's in tonight's Medical Breakthroughs. Since they were teenagers, Rick and Nanette Jones have been in love, a love that was almost taken away. I thought she was snoring, you know, so I roll over and tap her and, and I went to tell her that, you know, you were snoring and I looked over and I could tell that something was wrong. Nanette had a weak blood vessel in her brain that ruptured. At the hospital, the news from the doctor was not good. And he came out and he says, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. He says, we're not going to touch her. She's just going to pass away. <laughs> Then their doctor heard of specialist Frank Wayne Hellinger. Her aneurysm was in a location where it would have been uh, dangerous to operate. The surgical risk would have been high. Instead of surgery, he fed coils like this one through an artery to fill the aneurysm. In general, the coil procedure is easier to tolerate. It's a life-saving procedure that's recently gained popularity. It was just one of those things that's it's mouth to mouth. And if Dr. Montoya hadn't mentioned him, you know, I wouldn't be here. It took months of recovery, but Nanette is back with her family and her husband. While she doesn't remember much of the experience, Rick will never forget it. It's quite a roller coaster to sit there and have to tell my children that their mother was going to die. And then an hour later, I'm sitting there telling them that this doctor says that your mom will be back. <clears throat> your mother will be back to work in six months. Nanette is back to work after being dealt a second chance at life. To me? Uh-huh. <clears throat> More advances are underway for the coiling procedure. Dr. Huang Hellinger says researchers are testing new materials for coils that will react better in the body. They hope that will reduce the likelihood of a recurrence of another aneurysm. If you'd like more information about this treatment, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope and write aneurysm repair on the front of the envelope that you send us. You can also get information on our website. A drug used to treat cancer may also be useful in keeping clogged arteries open. In a study, researchers coated the drug Paclitaxel on the surface of a stent. A stent is wire tubing that reopens heart arteries that are clogged. According to the research, when doctors used the drug-coated stent, arteries stayed clear for six months in every patient. And that's tonight's medical breakthroughs, Gary. Very good. Time now to check in with Dave McCann, find out what's going on in sports. Tyson in the news again. Possibly some more trouble. Police searched the home of the former champion. They're looking into new allegations of sexual assault. This just weeks before Tyson's next scheduled fight. Also ahead, more fighting words from Bernard Hopkins as the fight of the year draws closer in New York. Sports is next here on Channel 8. Former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson has more to deal with now than just his upcoming opponent. As we reported at 5, Metro Police are investigating sexual assault allegations against Tyson. Authorities searched his Las Vegas home and say they're gathering facts. Tyson escorted Fernando Vargas into the ring on Saturday at Mandalay Bay, and he's scheduled to fight Brian Nielsen in Denmark in three weeks. Metro says Tyson has not been charged with any crime, and they do not have any immediate plans to arrest him. The fight of the year is Saturday in New York, where Bernard Hopkins and Felix Trinidad unify the middleweight they championship. They have chance to cook it, don't need to cook it. But just like any other execution, everyone is entitled that's waiting to get executed to what you call the last meal. Someone's steak and potatoes, someone lobster, 
somewhat whatever they want, but I got something special for Trinidad. I had to ask some of my Spanish friends in Philadelphia, what is your favorite food? Rice and beans. And let me tell you, it's enough for y'all. I got another bag in the car for you. I don't think I'd want to be Hopkins on Saturday. Mandalay Bay is home to the ultimate fighting championships this weekend. And here they are. These are the guys that fight without those big boxing gloves and without a whole lot of rules. Three world titles will be on the line on Saturday night. In a surprise move, the Washington Redskins cut starting quarterback Jeff George. He was ineffective in the Redskins' first two games, so they fired him and promoted Tony Banks. Uh, I was steadfastly hoping that this thing would work uh, with Jeff because uh, obviously had it worked, we probably wouldn't be 0-2. We might be 1-1 one one or 2, but, you know, not 0-2. I, I was hoping it would work. Well, John Robinson's not going to fire Jason Thomas. Instead, he's hoping to get the quarterback back to his old form against BYU on Saturday. That story is coming up in 20 minutes. Thanks, Dave. See you then. There's more, more news straight ahead on the eve of a high holy day for Jews around the world. We'll find out what Valley families say about the prospect of peace in Israel in the face of an escalating war on terrorism. Plus, families of the missing in New York City begin the heartbreaking process of filing requests for death certificates. And as the whole world is shaken by the attacks on America, some Valley residents are re-examining their lives. Eyewitness <clears throat> News Live at 6.30 starts now. You're watching Eyewitness News at 6.30 with Gary Waddell, Paula Francis, Kevin Jennison, and Dave McCann. We get too carried away with, with making cockpits into foxholes that pilots have to defend, we might start to lose, lose track or lose uh, concentration on some of the broader issues. Protection at home and a growing war abroad are the two top concerns in Washington, D.C. Lawmakers are trying to improve security at airports and keep the war on terrorism on track. Thanks for staying with us. We'll have more on what local families think of the efforts to keep the peace in the Mideast during this time of crisis. And we'll tell you how personal relationships are changing in the face of war. First, though, we want to update you on what happened today. Families of people missing from the World Trade Center started filling out the paperwork to get death certificates. Certificates today. The Pentagon called up more than 600 more military reservists for the campaign against terrorism, and 300 bodies have now been recovered from the rubble of the World Trade Center's Twin Towers. As the sun sets in the valley, local Jews will begin heading to Temple for the Yom Kippur observance. But for many, especially those who lost loved ones, things are different in light of the September 11th attacks. Eyewitness News reporter Eric Levine has more. The Yom Kippur holiday is a time when Jews go to temple to pray and ask for forgiveness for their sins. But this year, Ruth Furman, whose brother-in-law Stephen was killed in the World Trade Center, is trying deeply to understand the sins of others. My brother-in-law was killed as a result of terrorism right here in the United States. We just can't fathom this happening. And it really has shattered everything that, that, that we hold dear. While Furman heads off to Temple, a new peace agreement has been announced between Palestinians and Jews in Israel. And local Muslim leaders say it's important all of the world understands that it was the political motives of terrorists and not the Muslim religion that led to this month's tragedy. While we regret they do exist and they do not ex represent nor reflect Islam because their behavior, both vi this type of violence and suicide are in conflict to Islam, which means peace, and peace, long-term peace, is expected to come from all this. But first, the U.S. and the world are prepared to make justice their top priority and avenge the loss suffered by Ruth and thousands of other Americans. Eric Levine, Eyewitness News. If you are interested in donating money toward Ruth's brother-in-law or any other victims, you can go to our website at KLASTV.com. The investigation into the terrorist attacks has led to another arrest in Washington, D.C. Mohammed Abdi is being held without bond as an essential witness. Investigators found his name and number in a car used by one of the hijackers. And there may be more connections with the men suspected of carrying out the terrorist attack. President Bush expressed confidence in, a, in the 
CIA during a visit to its headquarters in Virginia today. The president continued to push for more wiretapping privileges for law enforcement agencies. The president also says the U.S. must not back down. We must never forget that this is a long struggle, uh, to, that, that there are evil people in the world who hate America. President Bush also met with Muslim leaders today, calling for tolerance for Muslims and Arab Americans. It was a day many New Yorkers have been dreading since the attacks. Hundreds lined up at 94 today to apply for death certificates for their dead or missing loved ones. Many of them say the process has not brought them closure, but it may help them start to heal. A father of one of the missing says insurance money means nothing. It's emptiness. That's all it is, because I'll never see my daughter again. The long of my life, the rest of my life, she's gone. People who used to work at the Trade Center are receiving loans to help pay their bills. Starting tomorrow, uh, cars with only one person in them won't be allowed to enter Lower Manhattan during morning rush hour between 6 a.m. and noon. This is a test run for possible newer, new, tighter restrictions. The attack on America has changed a lot about the way we live, but it's having some unexpected effects. Engagements and stronger commitments to one another are on the rise since the terrorist attacks, and others say they now have a different perspective on life and are changing their lives around for the better. Eyewitness News reporter Yetta Gibson has the story. Wow. Linda Brooks works for a local communications firm. Michael Bergemeyer is a retired Vietnam War veteran. Both say the terrorist attacks on the country have made them take a second look at their individual lives. When that happened, uh, I was just in a lot of pain and confusion. I'm living each day to, to the fullest that I can. Aside from a possible career change. I have been reevaluating and, and looking to go back to school. And Brooks has decided to dedicate herself to helping others. Anything we can do for others, opening the door, convenience store for others, anything that uh, can affect other people's lives and bring more peace. Bergemeyer says his changes will be mostly emotional. From now on, he plans to replace anger with love. I have five grandchildren that I'm responsible for. I'm the leader of the family, so I have to set an example. And this type of approach, he says, will win any war we'll ever fight. And that's the only way we'll change the world so that we don't have continued terrorist activity. As far as I'm concerned, that's the way to solve it. Yetta Gibson, Eyewitness News. We've closed our phone bank here at Channel 8 for the Victims Support Fund, but we're still collecting money for the American Red Cross. Your donations have totaled nearly $1.2 million. You can still make a donation at any McDonald's restaurant, and at participating McDonald's, you can also get an American flag T-shirt with a donation of more than $10. You can also give at any branch of Nevada State Bank or go online at KLASTV.com. A summit will be held in Henderson next month to talk about how prepared Southern Nevada is for a possible terrorist attack. Here's the latest on tonight's top stories. Senator Harry Reid is organizing the summit aimed at helping Southern Nevadans feel safer. Few details about the summit have been released, but <coughs> sheriffs, the Department of Energy, and local hospital workers are expected to be represented, along with a wide range of speakers. Las Vegas trucking companies are being cautious these days. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, authorities arrested nine people for fraudulently obtaining permits to transport hazardous materials. One local company is working to keep these materials from getting into the wrong hands. Prospective employees are going through extensive background checks. The company also told Eyewitness News they're concerned about a rogue network taking loads of hazardous materials that aren't being delivered. Some Valley police officers are also military reservists and may be required to leave their jobs if they're called to active duty. Metro is evaluating what positions may be open if the officers have to leave and just how to fill those positions. The officers' jobs, however, we're told, will not be filled permanently. They will have those jobs when they return. But Metro and Metro says public safety is the top priority. Metro is also looking to compensate these officers who may experience a pay cut while they're serving. CBS News is continuing its coverage of the attack on America and how America is fighting back. 
Tonight on 60 Minutes 2, CBS correspondent Scott Pelly shows us what could be the handbook for terrorism. Pelly shows us Osama bin Laden's how-to manual that was found after the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. You can see 60 Minutes 2 tonight on Channel 8 at 8 p.m. When we come back, we'll have today's Hispanic Heritage Profile. We'll introduce you to a judge who's working to help young Latinos in the community. The only Hispanic judge in Clark County, Valerie Vega, has spent her career trying to inspire young Latinos to stay on the right side of the law. That's just one of the reasons that Judge Vega is a portrait of success for Hispanic Heritage Month. Holly Gonzalez has the story. Department 2 is now in session. Honorable Valerie J. Vega presiding. Judge Valerie Vega has ruled the bench for more than 10 years. While women are still the minority when it comes to judges, Judge Vega is also the only Hispanic judge in Clark County. And I think it's real important that the kids know that the opportunities exist for them and that if I was able to accomplish it, then they would be able to accomplish it too. Judge Vega didn't start out wanting to be a judge. At one time, she was a court interpreter. But a good friend, a judge, also the only Hispanic at the time, convinced Vega she would make a fine judge. I'm very public service minded and I decided that I wanted to be a judge one day and I hoped that I would be given that opportunity. And this community has been tremendous in supporting me and I feel very, very fortunate for that. She went and graduated from law school, was appointed to municipal court in 1989, and 10 years later, Governor Kenny Gwynn appointed her to the district level. Judge Vega admits to being very public service minded. She regularly speaks at schools and is a volunteer speaker of the D.A.R.E. program. She hopes to make a lasting impression on these young people like her grandparents made on her when she was young. I loved all the time I spent with my grandparents and I have a lot of fond memories of that. The experience taught her speaking Spanish was important and she may be the only judge who can fluently speak Spanish. She feels just one more service to give back to the community. I feel fortunate to be able to, to have the benefit of knowing two cultures and two languages and that allows me to, to communicate and interact with more people. And I love people, so the more people, the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. Channel 8 and our Community Pride partners salute the Honorable Judge Valerie Vega, a portrait of success for Hispanic Heritage Month. She's a great person. Very nice. Coming up, Kevin will tell us if temperatures will be cooling off anytime soon. I'm checking in now with Kevin Janison. Find out what's going on outdoors. Kevin. Warm evening, Gary. We'll begin at the zoo in North Rancho where it's 89 degrees. Light breeze there near Sahara and Nellis, east side of the valley. Checking in at 92 with a 5 mile per hour breeze. Green Valley, Nate Mack Elementary is not too far from Pecos and Warm Springs. They're at 93. There's the breeze blowing down there. And in Overton, the Moapa Valley coming in at 85 degrees. Still 96 near Eastern in Charleston. It's already down to 89 in Summerlin. 91 on the Strip and 92 near Camino, El Dorado and Nan Road. 64 in the Mountain, 90 up in Indian Springs. And searchlights checking in at 86. Around the West today, plenty of warm air to share. Phoenix still at 105, Denver hit 89, Salt Lake City beginning to cool down at 84, while downtown L.A. topped out at 90 degrees. Around the country, a couple of areas of weather. First of all, that big system that produced the tornadoes a couple of days ago way out to sea, although the tail of the front still producing some heavy showers and thunderstorms in Florida. From Fort Myers southward, they have had some flood advisories in effect. Here's another area of low pressure and the circulation around it. Some cool rain showers in portions of Michigan and the upper Midwest. Meanwhile, you can see some of the cloud shield associated with Hurricane Juliet. Juliet drifting very slowly to the north. May be a player in our weather by early next week, but its forward progress is expected to slow. So on the other hand, maybe not. Here's your forecast for tonight. We're looking for a clear sky going down to 70 degrees for the low temperature. Just a light breeze tonight. That picks up tomorrow out of the, excuse me, out of the south, 10 to 20 miles per hour. There could be a couple of stronger gusts. Look for a high of 100 and some neighborhoods up around 105. And here's your seven day extended forecast. As we look toward the end of September and the beginning of October, there is somewhat cooler air to share. 
93s by early next week with maybe a few clouds from Juliet. We'd like to say hello to Troop 146 from Henderson. They were visiting us tonight. There they are. All and of them. All three of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a small, it's a small it's a three wise men. Yes. Spike on the right there is very interested in how he's going to get paid for his appearance here because <laughs> on his tour of the station, you can look in the can, there he goes. There's Dave told him that he gets paid for going on TV and coming down here, so uh, maybe Dave can help I us out. I thought everybody did that. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Just not. see Dave after the yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. How much are you paying him? You get paid? Yeah. I'll take care of you. <laughs> What's Thanks, up? Kevin. I get well, paid. I get free tickets. Or what else? Yeah. What other stuff? I, get? I don't get big cars. Big game this weekend. Yeah, big game this weekend. <laughs> BYU and UNLV mixing it up at Sam Boyd Stadium. Be a big crowd. And for quarterback Jason Thomas, he's got to find his groove back to give a UNLV a good chance in this one. Coming up, we'll show you what he's trying to do to get things back together. Also had medical update on runner Rebel Jermaine Lewis and a conversation with that man. Point guard Marcus Banks. Sports is next here on Channel 8. This portion of Eyewitness News is brought to you by the Courtesy Automotive Group. UNLV and BYU kick off Saturday afternoon at Sam Boyd Stadium, and Jason Thomas is hoping this is the week that he gets his groove back. Thomas has struggled in UNLV's first three losses. He's panicking and just trying to do too much. It's, it's hard. I mean, to be totally honest, it's hard because, you know, at my position, you, 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 you're the hero, the, you're the GOAT. And, and you know, you want to get out there and perform well and do things to help the team win, but sometimes you can get ahead of yourself. And so I think that's what I've been doing a little bit. Me and Coach sat around and talked about it, you know, this weekend and bounced some things around. So hopefully I can get out there and just play ball like I know I can. You know, I think, the, I think performance is a simple, sometimes elusive thing, but you never get a better performance in anything you do by making it more complicated or, or trying too hard. You, it's, it's usually rhythm, relax, uh, uh, not, not get uptight. I think we all just need to go out there and do our own job and uh, I think, you know, Jason's a great player. He's going to come back, you know. There's no, there's no doubt about it in my mind. I know Jason's going to be out there doing his thing this week and if everyone does what they're supposed to do, we're going to have a great game. We do know there will be a great crowd, one of the largest in school history. Just under 4,500 tickets remain, which means over 32,000 are out. The remaining tickets can be purchased through UNLVRebels.com or Tickets.com. But according to the coach, there is a catch. And the great thing, uh, and you'll be happy to know this, that no one can get in the stadium wearing blue. <laughs> Only way you can get in that stadium is if you wear red. So I, that all red, sold out, perfect. Wow, this athlete, you've got new rules now in your administration. Yeah, very specific rules. <laughs> Well, the Runner Rebels tip off the season on November 17th, and no one is more eager than point guard Marcus Banks. The local product comes to UNLV by way of Dixie College in St. George. Banks spent part of last month playing overseas on a team of junior college all-stars. Um, it was a great experience. You know, I played against a lot of bigger guys, and um, I played against a lot of great shooters, and those guys were smart and stuff. I learned a lot of things over there. Ernest Turner now gets to play. And, uh, and either back you up or play aside you. How big of a deal is that for this team? Oh, that's a, that's a big deal. You know, either way it go. You know, Ernest is a great guy. He's going to do well. You know, um, you know, I'm just, I just want to roll. I'm ready to roll. And the team, you know, we're ready. Indeed, here's an update on shooting guard Jermaine Lewis. He's been cleared to begin some straightforward running, but no pivoting. It's doubtful that he'll be at full speed until January 1st. The good news is trainer Dave Tomchek can start preparing him for a return. Lewis tore his right ACL mm. last season, but he is on the mend. Thanks, Dave. We'll be right back. Coming up tonight on Eyewitness News Live at 11, Las Vegas officials are pleading with residents to help revive the city's economy. Hear Mayor Oscar Goodman's plan. And an area limousine company has come up with a new way to protect their vehicles. Those stories and more tonight on Eyewitness News Live at 11. That'll do it for us. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tonight.